Okay, everybody, welcome back again. Good to be with you as usual um, as we roll through this fast moving, but uh, hopefully stimulating and um, you know important semester together. Um, this upcoming week, we have a couple of key dates. Um, as you know, we will have our midterm exam on Thursday. And so I'm also holding a review session on Zoom for the midterm exam where we can go over the study guide in some depth. Um, that'll be on Tuesday at noon. So um, I've sent around the link and if you'd like, you can attend that. If not, I'm gonna still post it for everybody's benefit um, afterwards as a recorded um, session. So you can add that to your notes, but at any rate, um, Prepare as well as you can using the study guide for the upcoming midterm of Thursday. And uh, as for your first essay, that's all been graded. I'm currently in the process of uh, sending back uh, scores and comments to each student. So um, you should receive yours if you've sent it and turn it into me um, momentarily if you haven't already. But OK, uh, there's only time for one more short little lecture before we get towards the uh, review and um, execution of the midterm exam this upcoming week. So. Today, we're just gonna take a brief look at one little interesting miniature topic for our semester. And that is the issue of genetic engineering and cloning. <clears throat> genetic engineering and cloning, that's our topic, uh, topic of the day, okay? Um, now, this is a class where we examine and study a lot of, uh, you know, current day moral problems and issues. That's something that I think adds a lot of interest and relevance to it. Um, so, you know, for example, we already touched on abortion and the ethics and the debate around that. Um, and another contemporary, meaning, you know, current day moral issue is this one, genetic engineering and cloning. This is truly a uh, current day moral issue because it really has only even existed, the ability to uh, genetically manipulate uh, biological materials really only existed in any significant way in the relatively recent past. So this is a recent historical phenomenon and technology, and um, it's moving at a very fast pace. In a way, it's moving at such a quick pace that our ethical intuitions take a little while to fully settle and uh, resolve themselves. We're some of the first people in human history to even pose questions about um, the moral um, you know, complexity of this particular topic. You know, for example, AI, that could be another one that um, our previous uh, forebears never had to think or worry about because such things just didn't exist uh, when they were alive, but they exist now and they're developing at rapid pace. So our focus anyway for today's little miniature unit is to look more closely at this biotechnology. Um, what are some of the basic moral questions that could be posed? Generally, uh, some people ask whether or not manipulating genetic material for desired purposes is uh, something that could be tantamount to playing God? Is it a, an illegitimate um, intervention into nature that somehow corrupts or um, commodifies it, or in other words, uh, poses some kind of moral problems? Um, if you alter genes to treat or prevent disease, is this morally permissible or is there some argument that that's impermissible? Would it be morally permissible to use genetic engineering to enhance uh, human beings rather than merely to just treat disease or disability? That's a major distinction that we'll circle back to, but uh, in the ethical debates concerning this technology, some people argue that it's um, more easily to justify genetic engineering if it's done to treat or prevent a disease or a disability, but it's a little bit more um, controversial whether or not it's morally permissible to use that same technology to enhance human beings beyond a normal baseline of function. So, you know, if I was born with a blood-borne um, genetic disease that made my blood not clot, you might say, okay, if we have a genetic technique that can be used to modify your genes to fix that problem, that would be fine uh, because it fits within the normal scope of the mandate of science and medicine, which is to treat illness and disease and to make people healthy. But what if I just wanted my child to be a little bit uh, faster at running or a little bit better at music? Um, or, you know, I don't know, like um, more uh, talented um, at some other endeavor, whether it be um, athletic, academic, artistic, you name it. There are many ways that genes theoretically could be modified to enhance human potential rather than to just treat disease or disability. And so, some people ponder the question, is one of those 
more easily to create a moral argument for than the other, or are they both justified or neither, or what? Um, there are many different reasons that people might want to use such mm, genetic manipulation to improve the human race. And of course, you might also ask the question related to this about cloning. Would it ever be permissible to clone a human being? What would be the reasons to create a genetic copy of an individual by cloning? One reason could be uh, to give infertile couples a potential chance to have a genetically related child. For example, you could simply clone one of the two parents and then they would have a perfect genetic copy as their um, offspring. And um, in that case, supposing that one or both were no longer capable or were never capable for whatever reason of procreating naturally through sexual gametes, they could still have a child that is genetically related to them, that looks like them, uh, continuing on their genetic lineage uh, using the technologies that were perfected and, and made available. What about if there was one of these two parents that wanted to have a child, but there's one of them that has a genetic disease that is inheritable to the next generation? If we were able to clone the parent without the genetic disorder, then we could bypass um, the problematic genetic profile of the individual that would you know, pass on that disease. So those are a couple of the applications that could be imagined, and we'll talk about others besides later. But we're just uh, introducing the topic for the moment and the reasons why such technologies even exist. Um, but I also want to talk to you a little bit about the scientific background, about what genetic engineering and human cloning actually are. Um, and that requires just a little bit of a brief um, crash course in certain facts about biology and genetics. So cells are the little building blocks of all living organisms. Um, each of us is really constructed out of innumerably many tiny little cells within our body. And these cells form the tissues, organs, and systems that power our lives and that we kind of just sort of take for granted every day. Um, DNA is at the core of these cells and DNA makes up the chemical code that that directs the construction, development, and operation of living cells. It's kind of like a set of coded instructions. You can think of DNA as a sort of the computer programming language that directs the um, hardware of your um, of the organism to construct cells in accordance with those genetic directions. Um, so it's almost like the computer language or software that runs the cells and transmits inherited traits from one generation to the next. So why do you have the appearance that you have? Why do you have the um, phenotypical traits that you have? It's all due to the genes that you've inherited from your uh, par parents, relatives, ancestors that have come down to you. Um, in all living organisms, no matter how diverse the you know natural world is, we've got you know human beings, all other mammals, lizards, uh, aquatic life, you know bacteria. But in every single living organism, no matter how diverse it may be. DNA consists of the same basic chemical ingredients and structure. So let's talk about that structure. The structure of DNA is a uh, double helix formation. <clears throat> so right, the, the structure of DNA is a double helix kind of structure, which kind of looks like a um, twisted spiral staircase, like what you're seeing right there. And uh, these two double helixes are parallel strands, which are linked together by chemical crossbars, kind of like uh, as though really a staircase where you have the rungs or stair steps um, connecting the two spiral um, arm rails of the stairs. So that's the structure of DNA, a double helix, parallel strands linked together by chemical crossbars. Um, and each crossbar is formed by a matching pair of chemical bases. Uh, those are known as base pairs. And surprisingly, uh, beneath all the complex diversity of life that we see and that we experience, there are only four chemical base pairs that generate all of these different combinations. So let me say to you what those four base pairs are. You have uh, <clears throat> A for adenine. You have G for guanine. Um, C for cytosine. And T for thymine. Okay. 
So the order that these four possible base pairs uh, occur in along the, the double helix strand is known as a DNA sequence. And the DNA sequence encodes all the instructions for making and sustaining an organism uh, throughout its life. A cell in the body constructs proteins in accordance with the code that it uh, reads off from the DNA uh, sequence. And these proteins carry out processes and provide the cell with vital you know, building materials. The entire DNA structure of an, of an organism is known as its genome. And the human genome has been fully mapped out. That was a big project at the turn of this current century, but the human genome project is a success. And we now fully understand its entire uh, structure genetically it consists of about 3 billion base pairs. And the complete human genome occurs in almost every single human cell within your body. So in all tissues and systems within your body, you've got so many of these tiny little cells, each one of which contains the full human genome. Um, the cell, reads, quote unquote, the base pairs, not as one long string of letters, but rather as chunks, or we could think of them as words, where each segment provides uh, instructions to the cell for making proteins. So in the same way with our language, right, we have letters that form words, but we don't say them letter by letter. We oftentimes, um, you know, condense these letters into phonetic sequences that form words, and um, that itself is a building block of a larger unit of meaning, the sentence or paragraph. So in the same way, um, the sequence of base pairs that are read by our cells is uh, not individual base pairs, but rather into longer chunks. And those longer chunks of the genetic code are known as genes. So you have individual base pairs that are aggregated into larger clusters known as genes. There are 3 billion base pairs, but there's only about 20 to 25,000 genes. And the length of the gene um, it varies with the length of the base pair instructions that pertain to that gene. Every gene within us has a duplicate, one each from your um, biological mother and one from your biological father. In the nucleus of each cell, the genes are further organized into bundles, 46 bundles that are known as chromosomes. And these 46 are arranged into 23 separate pairs. 22 are the same for men and women biologically, but the 23rd uh, uh, chromosome differs where biological males have an X and a Y chromosome and biological females have two X chromosomes. So that's the basis for um, at least genetic specialization of sex at birth. Um, now this labyrinth of genetic information is how the human organism is produced and sustained and how individual characteristics are determined. This is, for example, um, aspects of your genes and chromosomes influence the appearance of your hair color, eye color, um, skin color, um, height, and so forth. Um, now, when the entire system is working as it's supposed to, the organism is healthy. But if there's a genetic mutation, which can sometimes happen, it can lead to devastating genetic diseases or disabilities. Um, some genetic mutations are acquired uh, either randomly or through exposure to toxic, toxic agents in the environment like radiation or smoke or chemicals. But many mutations are not environmental and they come about rather through heredity, they're hereditary. And that triggers some mutations and diseases uh, to reoccur in future generations. So, you know, if you have a genetic disorder that you've inherited through, gene, through um, a hereditary mechanism, then it's definitely possible that you could pass that on to your offspring who would inherit your gene genetic features. Um, and some genetic diseases arise from a combination of both, from both environmental and or hereditary factors. So human beings, you know, we're such intelligent uh, creatures compared to, I guess, at least other non-human animals on the planet, um, that we always try to modify uh, the natural world to suit our best interests. That's why we've created things like medicines, transportation, communication systems, and um, even language itself. Um, so in the same way, uh, in consistent you know, pattern with that, human beings have tried to, in some cases, intervene in the genetic uh, constitution of our biological material to repair genetic flaws sometimes that we see. And this repair work that's done genetically is sometimes called genetic engineering. Other people call it gene therapy. Uh, it sort of just depends on the connotation that you want to attach to it, but um, genetic engineering, here I'm putting this in our written chat.
for genetic engineering or gene therapy, just uh, two labels for the same concept. That is, again, it's the manipulation of genetic material for some desired purpose. Um, we'll talk about what those purposes can be, but we're already listing off some of them. It could be to treat a genetically born disease or disability. Um, and there are three major ways uh, that that could be done. So Gene therapy involves manipulation, manipulating the workings of cells by doing one of three things. One possibility could be to replace a missing or defective gene with a normal one. Okay. Second possible purpose could be to um, repair a faulty gene so it works properly. So there's replacement, there's repair, and then there's also activation or deactivation. So activating or deactivating a gene. Okay, so about each one. Sometimes the genetic problem is that there is a gene that's inside that is uh, not working properly. So it needs to be basically replaced with one that does. Um, and so sometimes genetic manipulation can involve the replacement of a missing gene that's not even there or um, replacing one that was there but not working properly with a better and more properly working one. A second possibility is that um, it's not replacement but rather repair. So instead of actually changing it out with a different gene, uh, you just try to get it to correct itself or to, to modify it. And then the third case is activating or deactivating a gene. Sometimes there's a gene that should be active that's not working, and so you'll like turn it on. And in another case, there could be one that's overactive or doing something uh, undesirable, so you want to turn it off or to deactivate it. So far, most gene therapy has been of the first kind, that is to insert a normal copy of a gene into cells in order to do the work that defective or missing genes should be doing. But the thing is, it's not totally perfected, this, this technology. Um, Delivering a gene to a cell is difficult, and it usually has to be done by means of a carrier, which is a virus. So the way that that's done is viruses, the way they work in nature, is they seek out certain cells, and then they transfer pieces of their DNA into those cells. So scientists have discovered how to harness this capacity the virus has to transfer um, pieces of DNA into certain cells by taking certain viruses, deactivating the harmful properties they have, modifying them so that we just turn them into vehicles to basically deliver designated cells um, or genes into cells. Um, the genes can then cause the production of proteins that are needed to restore normal functioning. So I mean, they're not delivering cells, they're delivering genetic information to the cells, okay, just to be clear. So the virus, right, in nature, when you get a cold or something, this thing latches onto certain cells in your body and transfers parts of its DNA into them. Uh, that's what causes the malfunctioning of certain, you know, systems in your body when you become ill. Um, but we are able to take some viruses and make them no longer dangerous, um, but maintain their ability to act as transferers of genetic information into cells. So then they just become these kind of like, you know, vehicles that we use in order to be a delivery mechanism for desired genetic information to certain cells. Um, once that happens, if it's done right, the genes can then cause the production of proteins that are needed to restore normal function. One example of this that could be easily explained is uh, the treatment of a disease known as hemophilia. So when you have hemophilia, uh, the problem is that there's been a genetic mutation in some of your genes that are usually supposed to manufacture proteins that you need to clot your blood. So if a person's a hemophiliac and they take a cut or a wound, it's possible that they could just bleed out because, uh, and, and you know, die of blood loss because they're not, they don't have the proper kind of clotting proteins in the blood and their genes responsible for that are not working. So 
the way that, that can be fixed is, you know, scientists sometimes have used viruses to transfer normal copies of those genes into those cells, which enable the production of the proper blood clotting proteins. There's two main types of gene therapy as well. There's somatic cell and uh, germline cell. So, <clears throat> So one of them is somatic cell, and then the other is germ line cell. Somatic cell gene therapy, germ line cell gene therapy. Um, so in somatic cell gene therapy, we alter genes inside of a person's uh, somatic cells, and somatic cells just mean body cells. Um, for example, liver or muscle cells, uh, we alter genes inside the body cells to treat or prevent a, dis a disorder. So, Somatic cell therapy, modification of genes from body cells in order to treat or prevent disease or disability. In germline cell therapy, we modify genes in the egg or sperm cells or zygotes. Uh, so those are what the germline cells are. They're the gamete cells. Um, so... Okay, so germline cell therapy, modification of genes, but in this case from the egg or sperm cells or zygotes to treat or prevent disease or disability. Um, so the difference, another major difference, not just in the nature of which cells are manipulated, but in somatic cell therapy, it helps the affected person. So if it was a successful procedure, their genetic disease or disability could be cured. But with somatic cell therapy, because it's done to the body cells, the alterations are not inheritable um, to a person's offspring. On the other hand, if it's germline cell therapy and you're modifying the individual as a zygote or at the level of an egg or sperm cell, then those alterations would be inheritable to their offspring. Right now, germline cell therapy is not as well tested and it's not quite feasible yet for um, widespread use, but it at least gives the hope or dream to eliminate certain mutations from future generations altogether in the same way that we used vaccines in the past to all uh, eradicate certain diseases like smallpox, and even in the current day, as you know, uh, to largely suppress uh, some of the worst effects of pandemic viruses that, that emerge. Um, but some people also worry that in the effort to create these technologies that could manipulate genes and make it possible to eliminate whole diseases from the human genome over time, that if it was not done properly or if mistakes were made, uh, there could be nightmarish kind of worst case scenarios or that maybe the technology will be manipulated for purposes that aren't medicinal or that are not um, necessary. Maybe people will do it just to generate designer babies um, and you then worry about shopping for or selecting almost as though on a menu the exact features, traits, uh, etc. that you'd like your children to have. Is that a problem? Is it not a problem? I mean, we'll have some talk about that as we continue this little lecture. But the promise of the therapy drives research forward. And you know, in the scientific uh, field of biotechnology, there's a lot of, I believe, um, you know, optimism about the ultimate ability of these technologies to serve us like previous technologies have served human beings. At the same time though, to make it completely free of moral um, controversy, certain issues have to still be resolved. For example, it's difficult in every case to control these viruses that are repurposed as delivery vehicles for genes to certain cells. 
In some cases, we can't get them to accurately do that. And sometimes there's a risk that the virus carrier will be misperceived by the um, immune system as itself a disease and provoke an over-aggressive immune system response. So the field is still experimental with lots of studies out there, but few therapies approved for widespread medical use. Nonetheless, scientists do believe that safe and effective gene therapies, at least of the somatic type, are coming soon. There have been some more successful stories and some sad stories if you just go back over the case history. As one success story, consider this, it's mentioned in the book. In 1990, researchers conducted the first federally approved study uh, treating a four-year-old girl who suffered from a deficiency that resulted in a weakened immune system, and she had a certain um, gene that was missing. So a virus carrier delivered the normal gene to her immune cells, and it worked, and they gave her a normal immune system for a long time after that. But some other cases are not as uh, happy in the way they ended. Is One example is in 1999, 18-year-old Jesse Gelsinger had multiple organ failures and died uh, during gene therapy because his immune system had an intensely negative reaction to the virus carrier that was being used. So because of this and other uh, you know, problematic results, the FDA for a long time suspended clinical trials that use those procedures. But uh, in the more recent past, some of them have been resumed with just closer go government oversight and uh, restrictions. But many more questions about it focus on its potential to either help people or in a worst case scenario to do harm or to change the world in a, in a way of the negative. In somatic therapy, the risks have become the primary moral concern. But you know, defenders of the technology will say that if the harm could be mitigated, couldn't that dispel the moral uh, controversies? If we knew that the technology was safe and effective and not at all you know, potentially going to induce um, its own health problems, couldn't that alleviate some of the moral questions? With germline cell therapy, um, it's not as well understood. And it's generally thought to be unacceptable at this time for wide usage, but it's something that, again, holds a lot of promise, perhaps if it's perfected at some time in the near future. Scientists don't yet fully understand all the consequences of changing the genes of germline cells. And imagine that we made mistakes bringing about other disorders. Uh, couldn't those be passed on into the future and corrupt the human genome? So you really have to proceed with extreme caution. On page 318, they talk about some of the nightmare scenarios that people have. Um, <coughs> so, as it says here, um, the nightmare scenario is that genetic and cha changes are inherited by many people and the human genome is altered for the worse. These unknowns have compelled scientists not to renounce the research, but to proceed with extreme caution and to forego clinical trials until the genetics of germline cells are better understood. Um, yeah, just a little quotation from the textbook there. Um, getting back to my notes. Yeah, so other arguments for and against it don't focus as much on its um, uh, harm because they just assume that the technology will one day be safe. And then we can look at the question almost in a hypothetical sense, like if the uh, technology was safe and if it gave us a certain way in order to correct genetic flaws, wouldn't we be permitted or even some argue obligated to use the technology for that purpose? In the same way, you know, if there were safe and effective vaccines for children to protect them, like their primary vaccine se sequence that you get when you enter public school, some people might think it's an immoral act then to not provide them with the best um, you know, protection and inoculation against disease uh, that m contemporary medicine can provide. So if the same kind of options were made available, maybe in even more powerful ways, you know, genetic manipulation to prevent people from getting certain kind of heart disease or certain kind of current day illnesses, which genetic uh, engineering could uh, eliminate. In that possible future status quo, would it not be morally permitted or some argue uh, obligatory? to use such technology on people, including on children. Um, so the pro argument says that if we could correct those flaws, wouldn't we have an obligation to do it? And um, what about reproductive liberty? You know, some people might say that in a world where we could do prenatal screening and see definitively whether an individual fetus was going to have uh, some kind of genetic disease or disability, and we had the ability in the womb to affect a cure for that through genetic manipulation. Um, wouldn't it be part of the autonomy of the parent to have the right to decide whether the child will have that disability or disease? Um, now, of course, reproductive freedom is not unlimited, um, as we've you know had a whole debate on that issue in a separate context. Um, some people think that germline cell therapy 
is not the sole uh, choice of the parent. Some people would argue that it's disrespectful for the genetic diversity or individualism of the, of the human being that's being born, thinking of them as something to be optimized, uh, maybe for a purpose that they don't share. Some people think that it doesn't have the proper level of respect for human life. But again, those are just different opinions and different arguments can be given to justify either view. Now back to cloning for a minute. We've talked a little more just now about the genetic engineering side of this topic. Clones. Who are clones? Well, clones are genetically identical entities. Um, so that's really all that a clone is, but I'll put the definition here so that it's clear. Clones are genetically identical matching um, beings of whatever type. Um, clones, in, in some cases, could be just clones of cells or clones of molecules, clones of plants, clones of animals, or even, at least theoretically, there could be made clones of a human being. So cloning is the asexual production of a genetically identical entity from an existing one. So clones are these genetically identical entities, but cloning, let's get that in there too. Mm. The uh, asexual production sexual production of a genetically identical entity from an existing one. Okay, cloning. When what is the act? What is the verb to clone? <laughs> it would be to produce a, asexually a genetically identical entity from an existing one. Asexual production, so there's no interaction of sperm and egg when it comes to cloning. Um, we'll talk about the exact process in a moment, but you take the genetic information from one individual and you use that itself to splice them into uh, another um, by, well, we'll talk about the steps, uh, the somatic cell nuclear transfer process, getting to that in a minute, but it's not a sexual process of reproduction. Instead, it's reproduction uh, or replication of an existing genetic copy. Um, in animals and humans, the genetic blueprint for the whole individual is in the nucleus of each cell in your body. Um, in agricultural cloning, we've already done that, and that's quite common practice in agriculture. That's cloning of plants um, to produce a desirable type of crop um, or a desirable specimen. Sometimes we've also, for laboratory research purposes, cloned individual uh, human and animal cells um, there's even naturally occurring clones in the human world, but those are just identical twins. Um, when the embryo is developing in the womb, um, when it's still in the early process of mitosis and it consists of just two to four cells, you can separate them into two and grow distinct copies. That can be done in, in vitro fertilization clinic, but it also, of course, happens naturally a lot of times uh, to women that give birth to twins. You know, I, my siblings are triplets, so um, they started off as one embryonic uh, like uh, whole that then split into three. Um, but the most controversial type of cloning obviously would be to create a genetic duplicate of an adult animal or human being. So like clone me and the baby that's now going to be the result of that would be a genetic copy of me, but that's not the same thing as identical twins born at the same time who are siblings essentially. That would be to create a genetic copy of yourself. I mean, it would be the genetic equivalent of your identical twin just born on a time delay much later. Um, that's known as reproductive cloning, cloning an adult specimen, um, and uh, creating a genetic duplicate of an adult specimen, but they, you know, as a, as an infant or baby that's different from therapeutic or research-based cloning. And in 1997, the world learned that this really is a thing because that's the first time that we'd ever cloned a, a mammal. Uh, we cloned an adult sheep named Dolly in 1997, the first mammal ever cloned in this way. Since then, other animals have been cloned as well, um, and the method for doing it is clear and well understood. So the method used for reproductive cloning is the following. It's called somatic cell nuclear transfer. So I'm going to put that up here. Use the board for just a minute. <clears throat> so cloning in four steps, somatic cell nuclear transfer. Okay, so there's a couple of steps. First step, take the nucleus from an egg cell. 
remove the nucleus from an egg cell. Okay, so suppose that you have a woman, you know, who's ovulating, whatever, and there's an egg cell. She has a female gamete. Um, you will take that egg cell with its nucleus, and you will extract the nucleus, removing it, so that now you just have a hollowed out um, egg, egg cell with no nucleus in the center. Okay, so that's the first step. You have to denucleate an egg cell. Step two, you replace the nucleus with donor nucleus of a body cell from an adult that you want to clone. Okay, so step two, uh, replace the nucleus with the donor nucleus um, from a body cell of the individual you would like to clone. A body cell that is a somatic cell. Okay, so what I wrote there is step two, replace the nucleus from step one with um, the donor nucleus from a body cell of the individual that you want to clone. So you have your hollowed out nucleus, right? It's all empty. Now you're going to place in it a nucleus from a body cell of the nucleus donor. Whoever has given this uh, body cell, that's the, pe that's the person who's ultimately now going to be cloned by means of this whole process. So. I don't want to lose you, taking it slow. First step, you have an egg cell, you remove the nucleus from it. Now it's hollow. Step two, you reinsert a different nucleus from a body cell into this hollowed out egg from the person, whoever or whatever, it might not be a person if it was a you know, human uh, or if it was an animal, say being cloned, that could be another case like we did with all of the sheep. But anyway, this is the method of reproductive cloning that can be done in any you know, animal specimen. Okay, so we've got the first two steps. Let's talk about step three. <clears throat> step three is simply you stimulate the cell um, to initiate cellular division and growth into an embryo. So step three. Sorry, my marker right here is not the best one. <clears throat> So it says, stimulate the cell to begin mitosis by uh, electrochemical means. You activate this cell to start dividing. That's known as cellular division or mitosis, to use the scientific term. Um, it's not so easy to draw that, you know, with my limited artistic talents. But, you know, fire and brimstone, we got, you know, electrochemical stimulation. Now the egg cell is starting to divide into, you know, more than one. Um, at that point, it's growing, it's dividing, so you transfer it into the host uterus. So this is now a cloned embryo. You transfer it into the uterus of the host, whoever you'd like that to be, for gestation and birth. Okay, so I'll just put the fifth, sorry, fourth and final step right here. <clears throat> Transfer the cloned embryo to a host uterus for, you know, gestation, that's pregnancy, and birth. Okay, so it says transfer the cloned embryo to a host uterus for gestation and birth. So you went through this process, you now have this like dividing uh, cluster of uh, cloned genetic material, it's an embryo because it was an egg cell with the new nucleus that you started to cause division towards. Now that's going to be inserted into um, the uterus of a woman, let's suppose this was a human. And then nine months later, who's going to be born? A genetic copy of the donor of the um, somatic cell nucleus. Um, so the egg and the nucleus can come from two different people or the same one. Imagine if the egg and the nucleus came from the same person, who would that be a clone of? It'd be a clone of the woman uh, herself. You know, so like if she's the egg cell donor, she's a woman with an egg cell. 
and she wants to make a copy of herself, say, for redu reproductive purposes, like she wants to have a genetically related offspring, it's definitely going to be genetically related because it's going to look exactly like, you know, an identical twin just being born um, many years later. Um, the nucleus will determine the vast majority of a clone's DNA. So the donor of the body cell nucleus that is implanted into the hollowed egg, it is that individual whose genetic information is going to overwhelmingly determine the phenotypical traits and genetic profile of the, uh, the cloned individual. There's some mitochondrial DNA that resides within the um, shell of the uh, egg cell, but it's the nucleus that ha holds the overwhelming majority of content there. So far today, uh, no human has yet been cloned. But the reason for that is not because it's not possible. It's definitely possible, and there's proof of concept that's been demonstrated with other mammal life specimens, so we know it could work. The reason is rather because scientists, politicians, and philosophers have written you know, their concerns about the morality, the ethics, and even the safety of the procedure. Some of the criticisms, let's be fair, they're based on misunderstandings. Like some people say that, well, if we make a clone, then what is going to stop somebody from making a clone of, uh, you know, um, Adolf Hitler or something and, you know, trying to generate another comeback of, you know, the, of the Nazi regime? Or what if someone wants to have a, a genius so they clone Einstein just, and they put him to work solving all humans' problems? Or they want another, you know, I don't know, clone of Michael Jordan to have another <laughs> run through the last dance and watch him get all his titles again? That's kind of based on a misunderstanding, though, because even if we could clone certain well-known, famous, intelligent, brilliant, whatever, iconic people, um, there's no guarantee at all. And in all likelihood, they probably would not be anything similar to their famous progenitors. Um, the reason that's false is because genetic determinism is basically usually thought to be false. Genetic determinism is the idea that the... Uh, uh, the individual's entire character, personality, and identity is fully determined by their genetic uh, attributes. And that's false because we all know that there's the influence of the environment um, and the time period and so many other things, choices that one makes in life, experience, nutritional inputs that shape an individual's identity. Um, if genetic determinism were true, then you know, identical twins would always be exactly alike in all possible respects. And in my own case, you know, since I have siblings that are identical twins, you know, in many ways, they're not all the same. I mean, they do have quite a few similarities, to be honest, but they're not completely the same. And sometimes people that have been disconnected at birth later connect up later. Even if they were genetically related twins, sometimes uh, you find out that the other person didn't develop in the same way as you. And then, you know, I mean, imagine that you had like a clone of, of Albert Einstein that was produced today. Would he become another genius physicist? The genetic potential would be there. But we have no way of knowing what kind of uh, environmental inputs would or would not lead into that same kind of outcome, you know, or conclusion. Um, we would know that he had the predisposition to have such talents, like a, a, a Michael Jordan clone would have at least the genetic abilities that Michael Jordan has. But whether or not he would tap into them through effort, through experience, through the vicissitudes of life, you know, that's a completely different matter. So some of the concerns that, you know, we would just get into a game of copying people for our um, purposes, using them as means to our ends, it wouldn't necessarily at all uh, lead to that result. And there's mention of that in the book. On page 319 and 20, it says, even if clones are genetically identical with one another, they will not be identical in physical or behavioral characteristics because DNA is not the only thing that determines these characteristics. A pair of clones will experience different environments and nutritional inputs while in the uterus, and they would be expected to be subject to different inputs from their parents, society, and life experience as they grow up. You know, so yeah, like uh, an Einstein born today would be living in a whole new era, way different from the world of the uh, early 1900s when he wrote, you know, his famous uh, Nobel Prize winning papers on physics. Um, if clones derived from identical nuclear donors and identical mitochondrial donors are born at different times, as is the case when an adult donor is the donor of the somatic cell nucleus, the environmental and nutritional differences would be expected to be more pronounced than for monozygotic identical twins, because the twins at least grow up in the same time period as one another, so that factor would at least hold fixed. But um, reproductive cloning, where an adult person um, clones himself and we see you know, a child born a generation later, they would have way different environments, cultures, and et cetera, to, to grow up within. And as it says, even monozygotic twins are not fully identical genetically or epigenetically because mutations, stochastic developmental variations, and varied imprinting effects 
make different contributions to each twin. So that kind of gives some sense of con context and perspective on the somewhat, um, I would say, simple-minded objection that it leads to exact genetic replicas that, to be concerned with. Those that support the prospect of human cloning uh, point to the possible benefits. So some of the benefits, possible benefits of human cloning. <coughs> Let's just list a few of them here. I'll put them in this chat. <clears throat> Possible benefits of human cloning. Let's see. Um, so one is could provide some individuals with their only hope to have a genetically related child. Sorry. So yeah, um, <laughs> a little water. Genetically related children, you know. So that's an important thing to a lot of people. Um, to have in your life the opportunity to have a child that is genetically related to you, um, that's not adopted, that isn't um, taken on as like a guardian uh, from someone else's reproductive uh, path or from some other biological parents, but to be biologically genetically related to your child. Now, some people won't have that option for a couple reasons. Sometimes there's issues of infertility. Sometimes there are people who have aged past their childbearing years, and uh, they would not like to have missed their opportunity to have a genetically related child, even if they're past the age of child rearing. Uh, maybe some people could not find a partner in life, and they just didn't have anybody with whom to have such a child, and they didn't want to, I don't know, avail themselves of a anonymous donor. Um, so some might say, well, if you really wanted a child and you didn't have the ability to have one, couldn't you just adopt? And sure, you could, but to some in any way, they think that um, it's missing out on some essential element of the human experience or life uh, to not have a child that looks back at you with the same kind of um, genetic inheritance as you. Um, so it could provide the only hope for those, those in those categories mentioned to have a genetically related child. It could also be the only way to avoid passing a genetic disease to a child. So, so one. So, I mean, maybe a less a uh, prominent example, but you can also imagine, say, a couple where one of them has a genetic disease, the other doesn't, and they want to have a child, but they're afraid by mixing their genes together, one of, one of them will contribute to this. So maybe we can bypass that individual's genes altogether by cloning the other parent who doesn't have the problem. And in that case, you'd have a genetically related child that the parents could raise, but they wouldn't have the same risks uh, borne by taking on the genetic profile of the parent with a genetic disease or disorder. Um, another way of using the technology could be to clone specific tissues or organs for transplant purposes. So, so <clears throat> one thing to know about um, the technology associated with organ transplants is that sometimes the body will interpret the the transplanted organ as some invasive, um, dangerous thing within it to, to, to attack. And the nervous system, sorry, I should say the immune system then attacks the transplanted organ and that negative immune system response can cause death, right? Or serious problems anyway, health-wise. So imagine though that the thing being transplanted into you if your organ failed was not somebody else's organ, but rather something that was genetically a copy of your own. Uh, you could have then a set of organs on on call, as it were, for the uh, unfortunate occurrence of any such um, major failure of your own body. So, you know, tissues and organs that would otherwise be rejected if they didn't come from your own genetic material um, would, would be easily integrated into your system and therefore less likely to provoke any kind of uh, hostile response. Because you can tissue, sorry, you can clone just tissues and organs as well as um, whole specimens um, using these technologies, at least in theory. Um, 
So, and then one more, I don't know if this is really, this is kind of the weirdest of all, but it was mentioned in the book. If someone wants to uh, re restore the likeness of a deceased person, individual, let's say. So, I mean, uh, look, uh, maybe somebody had a child that died prematurely, like, and they're tragically, you know, like, drowned in the swimming pool or something when they're one or two years old. Uh, they might say, well, that was so tragic. I mean, now they're gone. We don't get to raise that person. But what if we could clone them not to have the same person back? Because we already talked about how genetic determinism is false. It's not like their soul would somehow, you know, uh, swing into the body of this new cloned individual. But it would look exactly like the person. It would have the same genetic characteristics. And so some people might, for sentimental or other reasons, wish to have that option too. Um, now, that's a little strange almost and science fictional to me, but, you know, to be honest, that's really has been done, at least with certain animals. There are very wealthy people out there who, in some cases, have paid a high premium to have uh, their pets that are getting very old or have, di or have died cloned so then they can have another run with an exact genetic copy of that pet, which would have, of course, the same at least genetic uh, indicators of behavioral characteristics and others, phenotypical traits too. Um, so again, though, it's a two-sided debate. Other people see the process as fundamentally immoral, like people are in thinking about manufacturing children as products, which could be seen as dehumanizing or demeaning. Um, but there's just a little bit of uh, lecture content. So that's like a big spiel to introduce this topic and give you some of its background and what the moral complexities are. Uh, there's only one author that I really had for you guys on this topic, and that's John Harris. Um, so I want to say at least a few things about his essay, some of the biggest and most important elements of it that I thought were worthwhile to point out. So John Harris is the author, and his essay is called, um, uh, let's see. <clears throat> Got it right here anyway. Is gene therapy a form of eugenics? That's the title of this paper. Is gene therapy a form of eugenics? Question mark. Okay, that's his paper, and this is from 1999. All right, so that's his question. You can see him posing it there in the uh, paper's title. And let's think about it along his lines. So he defends the moral permissibility of genetic engineering in a very robust way. He doesn't just say that it's morally permissible to use it to treat disease or disability. But he goes a stage farther, and he says that if this technology were perfectly safe and effective, then it should be morally permitted and even obligatory to enhance um, children beyond normal levels of function to make them as... Uh, optimized as possible to have the happiest and best lives possible. He calls this the beneficence argument for genetic enhancement. Um, beneficence is to benefit, to bestow a benefit on another individual, like to do something that helps them or you know, makes them better off. So the argument basically says that if you can benefit another individual, well, by definition, a benefit's a good thing, so you, it's a good thing to benefit them, and that the recipient of genetic enhancement would be benefited from the enhancement, so therefore one ought to do that. Um, now, some people say it should not be permitted because they think of it as amounting to eugenics. Um, but what does the word itself mean? The word, he says, carries a negative stigma because some people hear the word eugenics and they automatically associate it with the horrors of, say, like Nazi Germany or any kind of similar policy where people want to achieve some kind of strange or perverse goal of racial purity through mandated sterilization of like undesirable people. If you think of eugenics in that context, um, then yeah, you'll think that it's wrong and it shouldn't be done. But he also mentions that the word eugenics does not narrowly refer to those kinds of efforts. Um, in the broader, more contemporary context, negative eugenics is just a topic or a concept about um, using genetic material manipulation to prevent or treat disease or disability. So there's negative and positive eugenics, two different types according to the language used in the literature. So let me explain that here in the chat box.
Okay, so it says there, negative eugenics, the manipulation of genetic material to treat or prevent disease or disability. This would be kind of in the same realm as uh, an example we talked about earlier, genetic engineering to gene therapy to treat hemophilia, a person that doesn't produce the typical and, um, you know, normally functioning blood clotting proteins uh, can manipulate the genetic functioning of those things so that they are restoring it to normal function. But there's also positive eugenics, which is the more controversial kind. This is the manipulation of genetic material to enhance an individual beyond normal function. Okay, so if I want to make you tall, right, or a fast runner, that's not to treat a disease or a disability because it's not like a disease to be normal height or to be average in the, you know, speed that you could run if you were trying to train athletically. So positive eugenics would be attempts to improve on normal levels of function. It seeks enhancement rather than just treatment and repair. Um, so in theory, you know, germline cell therapy could be used to produce uh, children that are better in whatever way of the word better that you like to use. That's a major distinction in the ethical literature on, on um, genetic engineering, manipulation of material to enhance versus just to repair. Many people say that um, to repair or to treat disease, that's consistent with the mandate of medicine that we've already had for all these generations. You know, when people developed vaccines, surgical techniques, transplant uh, of organs, most people find those to be fair because it's just an attempt to extend human life and to treat diseases and disabilities that afflict us. But many people find more moral questions to be uh, raised around the idea of enhancement because you could say that that's not to just uh, repel or ward off um, abnormalities, but to make us better than normal. Um, other people like this author, don't think that that distinction is real. They don't agree that there's a real difference between efforts to treat disease versus enhancement. Um, he appeals broadly to the principle of beneficence. And that is that if it's in your power to make someone's life better, wouldn't it be right to do so? So now we're, I guess, able to state the general argument that he's using throughout the essay, which is the beneficence argument <clears throat> for genetic enhancement. So. So the first premise would just say that, I'm going to have a sense with the letter C there. The first premise would say that um, if you can benefit somebody, if you can be bestow a benefit on someone, then, then it's good to do that, that you should. So if you can benefit others, then you should. The recipient of genetic enhancement would be benefited by it. Okay, the second premise, the recipient of genetic enhancement would benefit from it. So the conclusion just follows. If you can benefit people, you should do that. Whoever receives this would benefit. <coughs> so <coughs> therefore, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> told you allergies are in the air. <coughs> anyway, therefore, we should genetically enhance children. You know, he's talking about doing it to the little children when they're still in utero so that they bear these genetic enhancements and then have them uh, inheritable to future generations too. Critics of his claim think that the technology would inevitably be used in ways that would create problems in society. So like some people say, um, do we really want to open this Pandora's box? Because imagine that the technology for enhancement is distributed on the basis of income and wealth, right? So who's going to really get this enhancement? Is it going to be everyday people, poor people, people that are struggling, 
No, you might think that uh, the market's going to be cornered by those that are wealthy and well-connected who already have all the social and financial advantages anyway. But now instead of it just being the haves and the have-nots socially, financially, and otherwise, it will be the haves and the have-nots genetically uh, creating a new breed of people that have access to all these amazing benefits that we don't all get. So some people worry about unequal social access to it. But Harris himself doesn't find that to be the most compelling counter-argument because he just sort of stipulates that, well, what if, you know, it's a hypothetical, what if we could somehow allay those concerns? Um, one way of doing that would be to somehow make sure that it's given out on a socialized basis to everybody or that uh, anybody who requests it can get it done for free instead of having something that's, um, you know, restrictions on access, depending on how much money or privilege you have. So anyway, is gene therapy a form of eugenics? He starts his paper by talking about two quotes. One is the definition of the word eugenic. The other is about encouraging the betterment of the human race. So eugenic, in the definition he lists, says, pertaining or adapted to the production of fine offspring. And the other quote is from this guy, Sir Francis Gowan, who said, it has now become a serious necessity to better the breed of the human race. The average citizen is too base for the everyday work of modern civilization. Civilized man has become possessed of vaster powers than in old times for good or ill, but has made no corresponding advance in wit and goodness to enable him to conduct his conduct rightly. Okay, so from these two quotes, he asks the question of the title. What can we say in response to the question, is gene therapy a form of eugenics? He sees two possible answers to that question. Yes, and so what? Or... No, so don't worry. So let me put two answers in the chat here. One, uh, yes, and so what? And two, no, so don't worry. Now, which answer is the right answer? Well, he says it depends on what you think the word eugenics means. Um, <clears throat> so it depends on the definition of the word eugenics. If it's defined in the way that this quote defines it at the beginning of his paper, that it's just about the production of fine offspring, just wanting you have fine children, then he thinks the right answer should be yes, and so what? Like, what's wrong, in other words, with wanting to have fine children? But if you think of the word eugenics as associated with the horrors of Nazi Germany and like sterilization and undesirable people or something, then he would say the right answer is no, so don't worry. So he thinks that understood in the right way, this is not morally problematic. It's just about the decision and the interest in producing fine children. Um, so the question then becomes, what is meant by the concept of having fine children? Does fine children mean as fine as a normal kid? Or does fine mean as child as fine as I could imagine a child being, even if I was to optimize him? S settling the question, he thinks, forces us to resolve with or at least grapple with these two big issues. Number one, is there a real moral difference between attempts to repair or remove a disability and measures that are designed to enhance beyond normal function? So is there any real moral difference between wanting to repair a problem or versus enhancing a person? And the second question, does gene therapy itself involve anything that is, you know, inherently morally problematic? So he goes on and he asks the reader this question, is it wrong to wish for a fine baby? And he thinks the answer is obvious to anybody who questions that. Uh, obviously, no, it is not wrong to want your baby to be a fine baby. He thinks, to the contrary, it would be wrong to wish for the reverse. Suppose someone had a child... And they're thinking the whole time, man, I hope this child has a birth defect or some other abnormality. Anybody who had those thoughts would be a perverse person because you obviously want your child to be doing as well, to be as happy and healthy as possible. So, you know, he puts it through this example. He says, suppose that someone went to an in vitro fertilization clinic and they had five eggs fertilized in five separate test tubes. And they're going to implant one, one of those five into the womb to become pregnant with it. So they do prenatal screening on all five to see which one's the healthiest. What if prenatal screening, pre-implantation screening, showed that two of these fetuses in the jar or in the, sorry, test tube uh, possessed disabilities and the other three were perfectly healthy? Do you think it would be wrong for her to just choose randomly which ones to pick to implant or for her to deliberately choose the one that was least healthy? 
This author says most people would probably come away with the intuition that if you have the power of knowledge, then of course you should prefer to bring up the child that's healthiest among the five fetal lines that were fertilized in the in vitro fertilization clinic. Why? Because that's going to produce the happiest and the healthiest uh, human life. And that's what you would want for your child. So he thinks that's an obvious question to answer. Is it wrong to want your child to be a fine child? No, it's not wrong. And it probably is wrong to not want that or to be indifferent about it. That's what he thinks gives us a motive to. Um, so he says, when you think about this question, it requires you to recognize one principle. that disease and disability are just undesirable things. We don't want people to have diseases or disabilities if we can avoid it. Um, that is the reason that we ever develop medicines or that we attempt to treat diseases or disabilities at all. Uh, you know, we could just be like animals that say, you know, we're just going to take it as it comes. Uh, but obviously human beings invent medicines, you know, vaccines, uh, surgical procedures, and all the rest, prosthetic devices, to best face our odds when dealing with the threats from nature and from disease. So um, shouldn't medical science, he says, try to cure diseases and disabilities when it can? What is a disability? He said it's hard to define that exactly, but everyone seemed to have this basic idea that it's a physical or mental condition that we have a strong rational preference not to be in. Okay, so that's his definition of disability. Physical or mental condition that you have a strong rational um, basis to not be in. So, I mean, uh, I, of course, have every good reason to, to not want to be in a condition where one of my lungs is collapsed and I could barely breathe or uh, to have a cognitive disability where I could no longer, um, I don't know, um, do complex um, arithmetic without getting a headache or something. So any of these conditions that would impair my abilities to act physically or mentally, I have every rational preference not to be in them. Rational meaning it's not just a, um, a unreasonable desire to not want to be in that condition, but it makes perfectly good sense from the standpoint of a self-interested, um, you know, creature. Um, he says it's a condition which if you ended up in the ER uh, with the condition and the doctor easily could have reversed it if they acted immediately, that you'd think they would have been negligent if they didn't reverse it. He says to, cons to think about it in the abstract, consider what kind of case you might make to a court if you were trying to convince the court that some product that you had taken in the marketplace had caused you to have a disability. Whatever you might say, oh, I can no longer walk as well, can't breathe as well, can't um, see as clearly, etc. Whatever you might say in order to justify that you've been harmed in some negative way by the intake of the product or such. That might be the kind of thing that Harris means by disability. So it's just some condition mentally, physically, that you would have every good reason not to want to be in. You can't list all the factors, so he doesn't try to, but he says with that broad explanation, we kind of know what it is. So isn't the standard practice of medicine and science, he says, to protect us from birth or even before against any potential disability or disease? It would obviously be reasonable to say that if we didn't protect people, then that might be injurious and wrong or even harmful to them. That's crucial because many people would say that while we're obligated to cure diseases, we have no obligation to enhance or improve beyond normal or healthy life. But the author now says, what is really the difference between a normal healthy life uh, in one generation and in another? You know, a thousand years ago, the normal human lifespan might have been 40, 45 years old. But now, if you died at that age, that would be a very premature death because, as you can see on like actuarial tables, the average U.S. lifespan for a man or woman is something like close to 80 years old. So the norm today would have been like a super duper lifespan back then, and the norm back then would be considered relatively disabling in the modern day context. So what constitutes the norm of a healthy life is context dependent. It can change over time. If you had gotten polio 100 years ago before vaccines for it existed, then you might just say, well, that's normal for people to succumb to that illness. But in a world now where there are vaccines for it and it's been basically eradicated, um, if a person doesn't get inoculated against it, you may say that they're disabled as compared to the regular population, but that same individual without inoculation would not have been considered such 100 years ago because of a shifting norm about what we consider to be the norm of protection against whatever diseases we currently face given current scientific and medical technology. 
So as he makes the same kind of point, you know, it's normal today to be protected against the whole range of diseases through inoculation, like tetanus shots. Um, and many people say that getting inoculated against them today and making one's children do it is more than just being permitted, but even morally obligatory. But what if in the future gene therapy gave us a similar potential to solve the AIDS or um, eliminate, you know, arthritis or um, heart disease? Wouldn't we think that such alterations would be mandatory in those cases too? One day you call it enhancement, but in a future status quo where it becomes the widespread norm, uh, today's enhancement is tomorrow's normal. What if we could genetically prolong life expectancy? Would it be permissible to let people continue suffering through the, judged by that context, the disability of only living to be seven years old if we could prevent it? He thinks that would be wrong. Um, now that is, of course, eugenic enhancement, but if the methods were perfected, perfected and safe, wouldn't the use of it, he thinks, be just as morally permitted or even mandatory as required shots? So his definition of disability, he thinks, has the virtue of being relative to changing uh, circumstances and conditions. He makes no claim to a once and for all fixed conception of normal human functioning. Um, now some people don't like his argument because they say, well, in, in the world you're talking about, we would completely eradicate like certain kinds of dis disabilities that sometimes happen to people. What if somebody was born with muscular dystrophy or some kind of other um, you know, significant um, <clears throat> A disorder of that kind, would we just genetically engineer such people to not exist any longer so there are never no new specimens born like that? Um, does this show disrespect to the disabled community? But he says, no, this is getting me all wrong. Um, we're not saying that we don't have any love, care, respect, uh, and concern for the disabled. Rather, it's trying to prevent people from being disabled in the first place. Um, he says, no one's argued that people who are disabled have lower moral value. It's, a dis it's the disability itself that's being attacked by means of these treatments, not the disabled persons who have the disabilities. Um, it also gives the genetically weak the opportunity to give birth to the genetically strong, so they don't have to pass on the same genetic disabilities and disadvantages to future generations. And same can be said in reply to any other um, arguments leveled in this same kind of uh, context, he thinks. When eugenics gets the negative connotation, it's not because it's trying to cure disability, but because it discourages those who are genetically weak from reproducing or that these people are less morally valuable. But he says in his way of looking at it, it's not that genetically weak people should be discouraged from reproducing, but that all people should be discouraged from producing children that would be harmed by their genetic makeup if we had the tools to prevent that um, before they are born. In fact, gene therapy allows the genetically weak to give birth to genetically strong, so says Harris. Now, um, <clears throat> if genetic therapy could delete genetic disorders or repair genetic damage, he thinks the use of the therapy seems the same as any other kind of therapy, and to not do it would be equivalent to causing harm. So suppose the therapy was able to cure AIDS, hepatitis B, malaria, or even slow down the aging process or your susceptibility to heart disease. Individuals receiving these enhancements would be a new breed. But in such a world, um, Failing to protect those through such enhancement, he thinks, would constitute uh, harm. Now, he says, think about it. A person today would have a shortened life expectancy if it was only 50 years because they'd be at a disadvantage relative to current norms. But if we could enhance longevity beyond the 70-year lifespan that we see today, then it would be equally disadvantageous in the future not to do that. He finishes with the aviation analogy. Okay, so... I wanted to mention this uh, as I closed his, his little discussion. So habeas, Harris rather, <laughs> Harris aviation analogy. Okay, so imagine that there's some new modification that can be applied to airline airplanes. And um, by taking on this new safety upgrade feature, the airline becomes much safer for passengers in flight and it reduces the likelihood of aviation accidents significantly so uh, people who fly on the airlines that take this safety enhancement are safer customers than those that take the airline that doesn't. Now, assume furthermore that every airline has adopted this new safety enhancement. So it's a system-wide, you know, uh, industry-wide enhancement that all have taken up, except one. Okay, so suppose there's just one holdout airline that despite the new norm of everyone taking the safety enhancement, they have declined to do the same. Now he says, what would you say of that one airline? Well, one thing you could say for sure is that they've been negligent 
and their, you could argue, obligation to their customers to provide them with the safest possible transportation because uh, there's a way of making the air flight safer that everyone else is doing, which they are refusing to do. So are they making their customers as safe as is currently possible with available technology? No. And then you might say that that's a harm that they do to their customers because, uh, again, customers flying by their airline are disadvantaged by comparison to others on the question of safety because they willfully refuse to take on a known safety upgrade that all others are doing. Now this becomes an analogy or a metaphor, okay? This holdout airline is supposed to be placed as the equivalent of say a parent that refused to genetically enhance their children in whatever ways we've described here in a future status quo where that becomes the norm and the widespread norm. In that same way, their child is like the passenger uh, by analogy that doesn't that flies on this um, holdout airline. They're not gaining the same kind of advantages and protections that people are in all other cases. So the decision not to have uh, imposed that enhancement on the safety feature of the airline stands just as the same kind of moral questionable nature of a parent or parents that would withhold on uh, genetically enhancing children of theirs in a future world where this is normal, safe, and widely uh, distributed. So I know that'd be nice to hear the other side of the argument, you know, um, but we do have to keep in mind the pace of uh, the semester and how quickly we have to get through a lot of stuff. So this is my last lesson for you guys on this new material before we get into our review sessions. So I definitely invite you, as I was saying before, to attend the review session on Tuesday at noon. You can find the link in my previous Canvas announcement. And um, aside from that, I'll be sending around our tests on Thursday and getting back to you with your exam, sorry, SA1 scores. So everybody have a great night. Uh, it's been great seeing you and talking to you and I'll hear from you soon. Okay, bye-bye.